want to start by acknowledging the very painful reality that we're experiencing in the world today. And there are many listeners and many people around the world who are feeling the weight of current events. And we want you to know that we feel your pain and we're here to have conversations and to try in the best way we can to bring some hope and healing to those who are struggling, those who are experiencing pain, which many of us are going through right now. Rufka, you have three children currently in Israel. Um, my nephew is currently in the northern border in the army right now in the IDF. And this is very close to home for us. And we just want to send out prayers and blessings to the brave soldiers who are fighting this war for us and hope that our dear hostages can be released Amen. immediately and uh, that we should continue to unite as a nation, a nation who has shown such resilience and hope and faith that is always united against hate, against anti-Semitism, and most of all, united in, in love and support for each other. We had episodes that we were going to put out that we have postponed in light of what's going on. And uh, instead, we reached out to several people, one being a, one of the top uh, trauma EMDR experts, actually uh, internationally recognized, who will help us understand how to best deal with the aftermath of the tragedy, of the tragedy that we've experienced. We also reached out to Rabbi Shays Taub, who we have looked to for insight and uh, teachings on bitachin, on faith. And for many of us, it's, it's very hard to tap into faith during very difficult times, and we wanted to understand how we could do that. And we know the power of faith, but sometimes it's hardest to have faith when we need it, when we need it most. And that's why we bring you this conversation with sensitivity and an understanding that and it might not give us the answers that we want right now, but it can help us feel uplifted and connected. This was actually an Instagram live that we did because we wanted to take this conversation to social media, which is one of the places where I felt we needed to have this conversation most because social media has been quite triggering these days with media wars going on. We wanted to bring a little bit of light into that space. And, and we did, we had a beautiful turnout. A lot of people showed up, a lot of comments. It was very engaging. And we decided to take this conversation right here to our podcast platform. This was our first uh, live conversation. It was also our first Insta live conversation, which hopefully we'll have more of those in the future. So there was a technical glitch um, that that cut the first 10 minutes off. But luckily, we, we came back on and we had an, a really uplifting, insightful conversation with Rabbi Taub, who really shared many pearls of wisdom and reframed bitachon for us and um, trust and, and, and emuna and faith in a way that felt attainable to be able to live with pain and also have trust and faith at the same time. And I'll, I'll just share with you something that he said in the beginning, because we asked him to define bitachon, which means trust. And he said, trust means a state of mind and heart where your behaviors and the way you feel are aligned with the situation that has not yet come to be revealed. So it's not the anxiety or the fear that you're feeling in the present. It's feeling the trust that what in Hashem, that what you pray for has happened in the now. It's that feeling. And, um, and we know that it's in store, even if we aren't seeing it yet, we start to live now as if it is. And, it, and if we can get to that point, then we're never truly lost. Yes. And in times like these, it's essential to acknowledge that nothing can grasp the depth of what's happening. But nevertheless, yeah. we, we can each do something and we can each hope that the thing that we do can shed a little bit of light. It's hard to know what to do. And somehow after, after this conversation... I felt that wherever we are, we each have some kind of light that we can bring to the picture and that that's the only thing we can do because if we just sink into depression, how are we going to bring any light into the world? How, how are we going to help our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land? And so it felt uplifting, uplifting to know that you can have compassion 
and you can also bring light. Yes. This episode is sponsored by Ten Yard, which I do actually feel is appropriate in the way that they bring light and they support a new bride in financially in whatever way they can um, for brides who need that financial support. And I think that it is so important now to support each other in the continuity of the Jewish people. And when we support a bride and a groom, a family, we're supporting Am Yisrael to continue to grow. One of the things that Ida and I shared, we had shared it on social media, six things that we can do to bring more light into the world. One of them being lighting Shabbat candles, baking challah, um, and one of them was to give charity because when we give charity, it saves a life. We want to do whatever we can spiritually to save a soldier's life, to save a captive's life, to know that we are doing our part in some way to connect to a fellow Jew in Eretz Israel, to connect to each other and, and also spiritually to create an opening when we give charity to save a life. So when you give to Tanyad, you're giving charity, you're giving yourself the opportunity for Hashem to do that for a fellow Jew. So the link will be in the podcast notes to donate to Tanyad. They have um, an auction that is taking place and you can choose from an array of amazing prizes. You can buy your ticket today at tanyad.org. The, the link will be in the podcast notes. And you can watch the phenomenal show on October 29th, where the raffle will be drawn. We were considering putting off the sponsorship for a later date. And then after, you know, Rifka and I, we talked about it. And then uh, well, why put off something meaningful? And that's, that's where we were at. And um, we hope that this will enable you to be more, to, to give Staka if you like, and to, be in, to participate in helping a new married Couples who need some extra financial assistance enable them to uh, to have more menuchas and nefesh, which is peace of mind in knowing they're supported. There was actually a very special energy online when when we did the live. We had hundreds of people who joined, and we look forward to you listening as well. And we hope that you, from listening to this conversation, feel uplifted, empowered inspired in the way of trusting and having faith in Hashem and to bring a little light into these dark times. Thank you everybody for coming back to our deep conversation about the difference between happiness and pleasure and how that it is possible to experience that with pain. Right, that we are in pain. There's no denying that. Yet in the midst of our pain, we can feel joy. And we actually, we didn't speak about this yet, but we must feel joy because so, there's a reason why. It's not just in order to feel good. Right, so, but what so is the add, joy? What is, what is- We need to add to Ida. Yes, Ida's coming. Ida, here we are. <laughs> you know when like a technical glitch happens and you're like- Well, we're ready at okay, well, we're, we're Everyone's come back. All right, let's much resolve. Much they love you, Rabbi Tao. Okay, well. But I, I want to... We, we actually ask. forgot to mention that we, we're going to... Uh, you know, we did mention that we have questions toward the end, which uh, we, we wanted for this to be about an hour long. Mm. Um, so I think we should leave some leave time for questions maybe in the yes. last yes. Uh, 15, 20 minutes. Sure. Maybe something like that. So what is the joy when you say that okay we we just differentiated the difference between pleasure and joy what is the joy that we should be tapping into right now right okay so first of all let me explain before i talk about how to try to feel joy i, I just want to make a case for joy because it almost feels like obscene to be joyous right right now and and i and i want to explain i want to make a case why it's actually a moral imperative to be joyous right now um imagine if you were a soldier and and you were on the front lines and you had friends and family who you had lost or you don't know where they are and and imagine you're told march and you say 
okay, with a heavy heart, I'm going to march. But really, my mind is somewhere else right now because I'm experiencing loss and grief. Uh, no, no, my friend, you're not allowed to do that. You are a soldier on the front line and a soldier has to march. You have to add Ida. Yes. Again. She, Where is Ida? Um... She wants to be added. I'm not, I can't add her, but you can. Okay, I think. Your manager, who is at the sticks that have to make sure to add Ida. Ida, are you there? Yeah, she wants. She wants to be added. I think she asked to asked to be added. Hold on, everybody. I'm waiting for Ida. Okay, she's saying to keep going. Okay. So, if you're a soldier on the front lines, you do not have the luxury of being sad right now. To the contrary, the most important thing for victory is troop morale. Every army knows this. That's why armies march with a song, a march song, because they have to have a positive up the attitude even though they're going to going into something that's terrifying even though it's quite possible that they're experiencing loss and grief but in order to be most effective they have to have troop morale so here's what every one of us needs to know wherever we are right now we are also marching into battle we just have a different assignment we have a different assignment. Most of us, the, na the nature of our marching orders are more spiritual. Um, we're not the soldiers on the front lines. We have to support through doing our mitzvahs and saying tilim and giving tzedakah and learning more Torah. And in order to do that well and effectively, we have to do it joyously. So it's not just like, Oh, I feel yucky right now because I heard some disturbing news. How do I cheer myself up? I mean, that's not what this is. That, that would be rather indulgent. Rather, what we're describing is we are collectively going into battle. Some of us are soldiers at the front line. They have a very specific mission and task. Most of us are the support staff. And we support by doing mitzvahs and giving tzedakah and learning Torah and saying tillim and davening. But what, one thing we all have in common is we are all most effective and bring about success most quickly and efficiently if we do our job, whatever our job may be, we do our job joyfully. So that's why we're talking about joy, not because, oh, I, I, I want to get geared up. It's not an indulgent thing. It's actually to the contrary. It's a selfless thing that for the greater good, for the greater good, we need to find a way to tap into joy. So you, you use the word positivity. Would you say that joy is also positivity? Yeah. There, joy, as we mentioned earlier, is a state of mind as opposed to a sensation, which is why we can be in pain and feel joy at the same time because pain is a sensation, not an emotion. Uh, and I would say positivity is also uh, like joy. Joy is a, is a product of a state of mind Positivity is that state of mind. In fact, I might even say the relationship between positivity and joy is that joy is the emotional outcome of the mental state called positivity. And so joy comes, joy comes from positivity. Yeah, yeah. And that both can be had simultaneous to experiencing pain. Pain. It's not a contradiction. So when we talk about pain, though, is, would you say anger is part of pain? Anger is such a, a difficult thing to discuss. Not, not because intellectually it's a difficult concept, but because emotionally it's very challenging because um, 
well, this is going to sound like I'm trying to be cute, but when you discuss why you shouldn't be angry, it tends to make people angry. <laughs> <laughs> but we are told, Kol anyone who becomes angry, it's like he worships idols. Why is anger like idol worship? Anger is a reality rejection. Anger is saying the reality is wrong. But if you are a believing Jew, you have to know that reality comes from Hashem. So rejecting reality is rejecting Hashem. We're allowed to say, I hate it. It's hurting me. Tati, please stop. It's hurting me. But to say it's wrong, that Hashem got it wrong, that he doesn't know what he's doing, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful not to go to that place. And I'm not just saying that for pious reasons. I'm also saying from a perspective of mental health, once you start arguing with reality, that reality is wrong, it's such a waste of energy because you can scream at reality all you want. It doesn't change what was and what is. However, through your positive attitude and your joy and your productive choices, you can have a hand in making a better future outcome. Because, yeah, that's, because some people would say, I think that it's okay to be angry right now. You know what I mean? Like you said, allow all the emotions. Anger could be part of it, but you're saying it should not be part of it. I think it's okay to be in pain. Not it's okay. It's not okay or not. It's not a question of being okay. It's an automatic thing. We are in pain. We are in pain. But think about it. Anger is something you have to choose. And I think a lot of times we don't even distinguish between the two because we go so quickly from pain to anger. Anger is when my mind refuses to accept my pain. When I don't make space in my mind for my pain, or I refuse to make space in my mind for my pain, that, that's, that's when I go to anger. So you're that's saying <laughs> when you're angry, you're not even in pain. You're, well, you're that's angry. why we do it. Anger is a survival mechanism. It's because I don't want to feel the pain. I'm afraid to feel the pain, so I go to anger. Interesting, because often when someone's angry, you'll say, oh, they're in pain, but you're saying they're actually avoiding the pain. Yeah, well, they were in pain, and in order to avoid the pain, we go into rage. We go into rage. But what I'm saying is allow yourself to feel the pain. And at the same time we feel the pain, we need to figure out how to tap into joy so that we can do our job and bring about... Well, someone's asking a good question here. Is there room to be angry at Hamas? Like, we can feel a whole lot of, I mean, it's very difficult not to feel angry at Hamas. Again, this is a very deep discussion, but do you think that any human being has the power to cause anything to happen in this world that Hashem hasn't chosen? No, I believe whatever Hashem created, he chose. So I'm going to sound heretical right now, but actually this is what a believing Jew feels. If you're going to be angry, be angry at Hashem. And then work through it, obviously, and work through it. That's so interesting. I would think, let me be angry at Hamas. Let me be angry at whoever gave back land. Um, why would I choose to be angry at Hashem? These were these people's choice. They were created, but it's their choice how they act. Yeah, but, uh, but Hashem chooses and orchestrates every detail of reality. So ultimately, the responsibility, the responsibility for all of reality lies with Hashem. So I, I say be angry at Hashem because you will work through it. You will work through it and you will come to some resolution. I have enough faith in Hashem and enough faith in the faith that a Jewish soul possesses, that I think that even if you're angry for a short time, you will come to a resolution. You will reconcile with Hashem. Why can't we be angry at Hamas? 
Um, if a soldier on the front line is angry, he makes sloppy, stupid choices. He has to go in with precision, with a sober, keen mind, and do what he has to do. In other words, those who have the job right now to take out Hamas are doing so with as much mental calmness as possible. And if you don't believe me, ask one of them. The people who have to go and actually get rid of terrorists are not screaming in rage. They're doing what they have to do with precision and focus. So they're not angry at all. They're, they're probably angry. focused on their job and we need to be focused on our job. Right. I just find it hard to think about being angry at Hashem. Maybe you're on a higher level where you're not, you don't struggle like that anymore. But some people do struggle. And, and what I say is, I'm not afraid of that. I think, what's the option? If you want to be angry at people, that's actually heretical because you're thinking that people run the world. And they no, don't. I'm thinking that they had choices and they choose to be evil. Yeah, and that's one of those deep philosophical paradoxes that there is free choice and people are accountable for their moral free choice and there's reward and punishment. And at the same time, there's hashkocha pratis, there's divine providence. And that's one of those deep philosophical paradoxes that we can continue talking about ad infinitum because it's one of those things that can never be tightly tucked away in a, in a neat little box. But they're both true. There is, there is moral responsibility and those who choose evil will be punished accordingly because there is justice in God's world. And at the same time, everything that happens was orchestrated by Hashem. They can both be true. Right. But, but I do want to ask you about being angry at Hashem. When you read on Yom Kippur, the Asara Haruk and Hamachos that, the, that happened, yeah. and then the Malachim asked, asked Hashem, mm -hmm. how could this have happened? And Hashem says, if you ask me another word, I'm going to turn the world to water. Yeah. So then I would think we, we should not be angry at Hashem. We shouldn't question and we shouldn't, we shouldn't be angry. Well, that's an actually interesting story. Um, yeah, you're right. When they're killing the 10 martyrs in the M. Kippur story there, um, and the angels are so horrified of, of, the, of the sages, that the angels go on high and they ask Hashem, how can this be? This Say, uh, is this is this is the reward for learning Torah, and Hashem tells them to to, to be silent, or He'll change the world back to uh, the chaos and the void that it was before the world was created. So, if you read that story cursorily, it sounds like it's basically telling you don't cause trouble, don't ask questions, you're not allowed to question Hashem. But is it, it's a much deeper story. The story really is that Hashem is explaining to the angels how to get their answer, the answer that they want. They ask the question, and Hashem says, here's your answer. There's, there's a, a parable that's told about a king who hired a tailor to make him a suit. So the king gave the tailor a bolt of cloth, and he told the, the tailor to make him a suit out of the bolt of cloth. So the, the tailor comes and brings the suit to the king. And one of the king's advisors wanted to make trouble. So after the king tried on the suit, and the king really liked the suit, and he was very happy with the tailor, but this jealous advisor says to uh, the king, hey, king, ask the tailor, where's the extra cloth? There's no extra cloth. That means he's stealing from you. He pocketed the extra cloth. So the king says, hey, that's right. You know, we'll make a suit. You cut from a pattern. You may draw a pattern on the suit. So, so the king says to the tailor, where's my extra cloth? And the, sailor, the, the tailor grabs the scissors and he grabs the suit, the king's suit that he's wearing, and he starts to cut along the seam. And the king pulls his hand back and says, oh, hold on, why are you cutting the seams? The tailor says, well, you want to see that I didn't steal any cloth. I was kind of worried that I... I might be accused of that. So what I did is I made a pattern where every single stitch of cloth in the original bolt of cloth is used in the suit. 
There's no excess cloth. It's all in the suit. But the only way I can show that to you is to take the suit apart, stitch by stitch, take out the seams, and then I'll lay out the whole suit in front of you, and you'll see the entire bolt of cloth in front of you. The king says, you know what? I like the suit. Just leave it. Don't take it apart. I believe you. So, too, the angels say, how is this possible that the torture of the innocent, of the righteous, should have a place in your world? And God says, you want to see? Let me turn the world back into tayu vavayu, back into the raw materials. And if you could stand with me where I stood before the world existed, you would be able to see how every single stitch of cloth is used in the suit. In other words, how everything in the world is accounted for. That somehow, from a perspective of infinite wisdom, somehow it all makes sense. But if you want to look at it when the suit is already made, if you're coming into the world as a made world, and you're looking at isolated incidents, there's no way to make sense for it, even from the mind of an angel. And that, that's really the lesson to us. Our minds cannot make sense of this. We are not God. We do not have the, 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 uh, the benefit of infinite wisdom. We were not there before the world was created. If we were, then somehow we would see how everything makes sense. But we can't, and we shouldn't even try to. We shouldn't try to make sense of the senseless. That's, that's not what the, 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 the faithful response is. The faithful response is, God is a true judge. And yet that doesn't have to mean I'm okay with it. I'm a human being. I'm a mortal, finite mind. And my mind doesn't know how to make sense from this and shouldn't attempt to make sense from it. And that's what you do when something is beyond our ability to to process cognitively, so that's where faith begins. Oh, Ida, you came back. I've been watching, though. We I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. It's, it's been heavy. <laughs> Ida, do you have any comments on what Rabbi Taub just said? Well, I've been in and out trying to resolve this technical oh. issue, so. Okay, but let's, you're back. Let's wait a bit, um, yeah. Yes. Okay, so that, that answers why we shouldn't, why it's, we're too finite. We're finite. We're not going to have the answer to, so we shouldn't ask, we, we're not going to ask the question, but more about the anger issue. I don't know. I still am stuck on why I can't be angry at Hamas. <laughs> I'm still stuck on, it's very hard not to be angry at evil. Why not be horrified? Why not be heartbroken? Why not be in pain? Why aren't those acceptable alternatives yeah not choosing not to be angry doesn't mean that you like what happened i think you know there's an expression when uh, to a man that only has a hammer everything looks like a nail i think we're so used to responding with anger as our go-to response to anything that we don't like that we assume anger is the only way to respond to something painful. And I'm saying there are other ways of responding other than anger. And it doesn't mean that something's okay. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to totally change the subject for a minute. But, you know, I speak to a lot of people who are experiencing acute stress in, in personal relationships. And a lot of times, the problem, the common problem is boundaries, that they don't know how to set boundaries. And what will happen is they will allow themselves to be disrespected over and over and over again until finally they break. And they'll feel ashamed for raging. They'll feel, they'll get a rage hangover the next day, but then they'll say, but what do you want me to do? Until I raged, I wasn't safe. The only way I was able to get this person to back off was by screaming at them. I mean, I've had this conversation hundreds of times. I'll always ask them, why, why did you wait until you were so overwhelmed that you were full of rage? Could you have set, what, if, what would have happened if you would have set that boundary earlier? And the honest answer, if someone is capable, oh, capable of being honest is, you know what? Not only I could have set that boundary earlier, but I actually would have set it a lot more effectively if I did it before. 
or I have lost control of my faculties. So a lot of times we think it's the rage that gave us strength and power. And the truth is, is that we can have a lot more strength and power and make a lot better choices if we act without rage, if we act before the rage. Now let's plug this back into the, the, this discussion about Hamas. You want to deal, deal with Hamas when you're in a state where your mind can't function? That, that's, that's the whole problem is that we waited until we were in this state. It has to be dealt with in a, in a, in a, in a, with a sober mind. The whole problem is the dysfunction of doing what's politically um, popular and kicking the can down the road and forcing yourself to not respond until you're in unfathomable anguish. I think, I think that's, that's part of the dysfunction. Someone's asking, is it fear an emotion or a sensation? Well, it depends how you define it. There's a shock, which is a sensation. Like if I walk up behind you and I say, boo, okay, that's, just, that's a sensation. And you feel the adrenaline rush and everything. But then later that night, three in the morning, I'm lying in bed. And because my adrenaline was up earlier that night, I start thinking about all the things in life that are scary. That's fear and that's an emotion. So sensations generally happen automatically, immediately as a stimulus response. Emotions happen through a thinking pattern. We create them by our thoughts. So the fear that we normally speak about and that we're normally dealing with is an emotion. And it was sourced in our thinking thoughts thoughts that bring us to fear. I think one question that I often try to ask myself is what is it accomplishing for me? Or like with Bitachin is what would I do? You know, let's say oftentimes when we're looking back at a situation that was very difficult or um, it's, it's much easier to connect the dots, right? When you're looking back, at it. when you're in it, it's much harder to, you know, to really uh, to know what to do. And um, so in those moments, this, this is more, it's much more easily said than it is done. But just to say is that what is it? Let's say you're quick talking about anger. Um, you know, what is being angry at Hamas accomplishing for us? What is it actually doing right. for us? You know, and being angry at Hashem is, is putting our trust in Hashem. When you put your trust in someone, you could be angry at them too. It's relationships have mixed emotions in them. So we can be angry at Hashem and say, Hashem, you know, why are you doing this? Help me understand. And at the same time, believe and hope that maybe we don't understand. Maybe this is, there's something we just simply don't understand right now that's beyond our ability to, to absorb. I, I was saying before, I think when you were off, but, you know, I'm not afraid of people getting angry at Hashem because I have enough faith in Hashem and enough faith in the faith that a Jewish soul possesses that you'll work through it. You'll work through it and you will come to a resolution. Uh, um, part of putting your trust in Hashem and learning how to get better at it is learning. It's a learning curve, learning what to do and how to process it when things happen that our finite minds can't accept. That's part of learning how to have faith. It's part of the process. It's okay. Well, it's interesting how it relates to, you know, when you, in a relationship, when you put your trust, you know, Brene Brown talks a lot about vulnerability with trust, is that when you fully put your trust in someone, you're also risking uh, pain because you're, you're just essentially giving, you know, you're, you're putting your trust in someone and that doesn't mean that you're not going to get hurt. You might get hurt and then, but you're, what you're saying is I'm willing to take that chance for the sake of a relationship that will allow me to become more spiritually connected with this other person and even connected to myself. So trust does involve pain. And I think maybe that's something that we need to also apply in Shem. Yeah, I, I, I think any real relationship by definition entails vulnerability. And 
vulnerability is vulnerability to what, right? To getting hurt. And we do get hurt in our relationship with Hashem because I, I, I don't know if you're on with us, but be, before we were discussing the, the story that we read in the Yom Kippur davening when the 10 martyrs are being tortured and the, even the angels can't fathom and the angels complain. Um, so we're saying there are things that even an angel can't understand. So, so how much more so a human being, there are things we don't understand. And if we're in a real relationship with Hashem, there are going to be those moments where it's just like, I don't know what to do with this. And if it's an authentic relationship, <laughs> we have to allow ourselves to have those experiences. And I do believe that not only we will come out of those experiences, but that's really what strengthens the relationship. It's not the end of the story. It's part of a process. So what about the, uh, and I don't know if this is going to open Pandora's box, but um, should we, there's, you know, all these media outlets that are spreading false, false information. Should we be fighting this media war that's going to bias against Israel or should we be? Well, everybody oh. has to do their part. You know, the soldiers have their part and those who can fight media bias can do that if that's their skill set. Everybody has to do their part. Um, somebody has a lot of money, they should give tzedakah. Somebody who uh, is, a, is a teacher should be teaching twice as much right now. Uh, so, whatever you're good at. I mean, I've, I'm hearing about uh, therapists and mental health counselors flying to Israel right now just to help. Whatever you can do, you should do. We, we can't all be a jack of all trades. We can't do everything. Um, so the answer to the question, should this be done, should that be done? Yeah, by those who are in a position to do it. You know, it's like when, God forbid, somebody has an illness, so then they make themselves like an amateur expert in their illness and they just spend all day on Google researching symptoms. That's not productive. You know, there's somebody who went to school and became a specialist and you find the best specialist and you find a second opinion and you make sure that you have the best people working and let them do it, right? So you let the specialists do what they're supposed to do. And uh, each of us should be productive in the best way that we can be productive. It's, it's just, it's, it's a hard thing because everybody is on social media. I mean, most people. And then, you know, you, you, you see a lot of Instagram posts on um, yeah. anger or on responding to someone that hasn't, you know, stood up for the Jewish people and it can start, you know, who are those people that are meant to be doing that? Yeah. Should everybody be doing that, responding? I mean, would you do that? You mean if somebody makes a nasty comment? Yeah. But I respond to it? Yeah. I've been blocking. Because you yeah. feel you have a different role to because play. Because, oh, like someone just wrote, stay in your lane. You know, I think that many of us have this false assumption that we have to do what other people say we need to do during this time. And I, I actually felt free of this myself because when people were saying, you know, we need to, we need to you know, post this anti um, Hamas stuff. And so, yeah, of course I, I, I would if that was my role here, but our our podcast is dedicated to something very specific on our platform to dedicate ourselves to, um, you know, to positive change. We're, we're very specific in our mission and we're trying to stay true to that because we believe that if we spend our time doing what, and this is how we started this conversation. Um, Rabbi Tao, before you jumped on, we were saying that, think about what's the best use of your time. Where value at you know and, and use your time to do that so if you're a teacher maybe teach you know maybe volunteer to do a zoom class with maybe with kids in israel if you're a therapist maybe take on some additional hours if you can uh, whatever you're already doing maybe do a little bit more of that and i think that just be mindful uh, it don't don't you don't always have to listen to what everyone is saying i think you have to do this from the inside out you know, trust your own intuition. So I guess you need to be true to yourself about what is this my role? You know, someone, someone like Noah Tishby, who we, we plan, we actually plan, we have scheduled to interview, is someone who does this for a living, you know? Right. I mean, so, she's an expert. 
and she's an expert. So she should be doing that. Someone's got to stick up for the Jewish people. The question yeah. is, you know, sometimes you wonder, is it meant to be every one of us? But I guess the way we can stick up for the Jewish people is by doing our part in whatever that may be. It doesn't have to mean defending somebody. I just want to, you know, I don't want to change the subject. I'm not trying to like avoid this, this topic, but I just want to throw something at you as a counterpoint. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, I'm, I'm on lots of platforms and so I'm out there and I've, I've had vile comments. And, and like I said, my, my, my approach is blocked. I just, I can't afford to give energy to it, but I want to tell you something disproportionately, disproportionately, I'd say 50 to one. I found wonderful, supportive, loving, positive comments. And I'm saying specifically from what, what appears to me to be non-Jews. So, you know, we could focus on the disgusting reaction, which certainly exists and we're not denying it. We're not, it doesn't help us to, to pretend it doesn't exist. But I just wanna share also, at least my personal experience has been disproportionately that non-Jewish people are going out of their way to to share very heartfelt supportive words and that's kind of like the energy that i want to not only absorb but like give back to like someone who reaches out that way i want to i want to engage with that person not not the opposite stuff we're with you on that yeah, Tony's I'm with you. Broke, i do i'm this i'm this guy. type of person that likes to stick up for people. Me. Do you know what I mean? That's like, the guy from Oklahoma. sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Tony used grow equipment. We love you, brother. Okay, this is a guy I've never met in my life. He's in Oklahoma. He likes a lot of my content. I get his like his heart. Are you talking whatever. about Tony's used grow equipment? Yeah. Oh, hi, 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 and thanks for joining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a non-Jewish guy in Oklahoma. I think he's in Oklahoma, and and, and, and yeah, like that kind of positivity. And, and by the way, if you need used grow equipment, go to Tony's <laughs> used grow equipment. But I'm saying, do you know what I mean? I, I'm the type of person that likes to stick up for people. And so initially I was like, am I meant to be sticking up by responding to certain comments? But then you realize, you know, I have a role to play. This may not be my role. I, I want to give my energy to positive people. And there's so many positive people out there and we shouldn't ignore them. Right. Like somebody who stands up right now and shows solidarity with the Jewish people, like they yes. need your attention. If you're Jewish and you, and then you, if someone's randomly reaching out to you and showing you support, like give them time, give them, give them some respect. Like that's, that's a big deal. So that's where our energy should be going. Yeah, where well, we say where where focus goes, energy grows, and I like that example. I like oh, say that again. Where focus goes, energy grows, and we tend to focus. If somebody were to give you five compliments and one insult, what are you remembering? I mean, we mentioned this on the podcast. You know, we're going to remember the negative stuff people say. It doesn't mean we have to focus on it. If we want to address when we feel equipped to do so. Then, by let's do it. But I love the uh, the uh, the uh, I, this idea is just focusing on the positive and bringing in more positive and hopefully making a difference in that way which yeah but on that subject practically speaking someone goes onto the news and they can feel like some of the words we use this emotion of fear and overwhelm so when someone experiences that how would you say they should bring the tachon into the picture what I'm, I'm they do? Say something very radical okay like i'm not going to answer your question i'm actually going to refuse the premise of your question and i'm going to explain why okay so you said if somebody goes on the news and they get shocked horrified dismayed depressed okay what should they do and i'm going to i'm going to counter that and say don't go on the news well yeah someone just wrote turn off the tv that's turn right off the TV. It's, you know it's your I've been saying this for years, but now maybe people will take it seriously you're not more informed by consuming media you are misinformed i promise you you're not more informed get rid of it go on a media fast i believe very strongly that these devices this one i'm shaking my hand right now okay yeah you're phone. on it <laughs> okay, i'm on it i believe very strongly that if you use them to consume they poison you 
if you use them as a tool to put out, then they're an incredibly effective um, amplifier or megaphone. Okay, so that's the way that I try to look at it. And, and I know for myself, whenever I pick up this device, let, let's not even talk about when there's horrifying news. Let's just talk about in a regular average time. When I pick up this device in order to give to myself, like to, to, to whatever, I'm bored and I'm just scrolling and whatever, it, even if I don't encounter anything traumatizing, it's not healthy, good feeling. But if I pick up this device and I use it to put something out there, even if it just helps one, one person, I, I, I end up feeling great. So don't use this device to consume. Use this device to put things out there. Pick up the phone and reach out to somebody. Just start start texting people words of support. Okay, so put that's, I'm with you. So that's social media. I'm talking about the actual news. You wanna know when, when the soldiers no are going out into Gaza. No news. You know, I, I was just asking you more on a spiritual level. How do you go to, like if someone does wanna know the news, they wanna be updated. How would, you're saying no news? No, no, I'm saying no news. Are you just gonna I, be I, I'll, I'll put it like this. I'm putting it like this. If somebody says to me, um, if somebody comes to me, and let's say I'm a personal trainer, mm -hmm. okay? And they come to me and they say, listen, I want to eat a pizza, whole pizza every day for lunch. And I wanna eat 12 pieces of fried chicken every night for dinner, and I want to lose weight. I'll tell them, listen, I can't stop you. You can eat a whole pizza for lunch, you can eat 12 pieces of fried chicken for dinner, but you can't do that and lose weight. So you're going to say to me, I want to watch news, and I want to be in a really healthy headspace. You can pick. You can do one or you can do the other. I'm not making you do anything. I'm just telling you, you can do one or the other. And if, and if you and if you can consume the news and be in the party space, yeah, I'm saying you can also exactly you can also consume the news and learn Shabbat Shalom at the same time. We're still, so there's somebody we want. I still want to have time for questions that we're already okay. Asking. I just wanted somebody to actually ask this before we go to the questions of everybody. I wanted to ask this one question because this is something that I know is um, very conflicting at the moment for a lot of parents. So. Many parents have kids in Israel, I, I being one of them, but I made the choice to, this is how I, my, what my intuition told me was that it's my kids' choice as to what they want to do, if they want to stay, or if they want to go. There are some parents that are unsure about that, or they are very adamant that their kids to come, should come home on, and, and maybe they don't want to, um, or some feel that they should stay there because the, Re the Lubavitcher Rebbe had said in the past that, um, Eretz Yisrael is the safest place. Yet today it is, it is living today where, where this situation has never happened before. Um, I wanted to know what you would advise a parent it, to do. I think that Ebba's advice in 1990 was that, well, when was the Gulf War? Right. It, uh, yeah. Was that uh, 89, 90, when uh, Saddam Hussein had scuds pointed at Tel Aviv? And there was real terror. I remember very clearly. People asked the Rebbe about bringing kids home from Yeshiva. And the Rebbe said, uh, Eretz Yisrael is the safest place. You're going to say, well, it, it, in that case, it turned out that there were no deaths from the Scud missiles. But, you know, sometimes uh, it won't turn out that way. So whenever, whenever the, the Gulf War took place, you got to remember, that wasn't the first time there was a threat of violence in the Holy Land. I mean, how many thousands of Jews, I, I don't like to speak about these things, but how many thousands of Jews were, were, were killed in the War of Independence or in the Six Day War or in the Yom Kippur War? So it's not like it never happened that Jews got killed in, in Israel and how many different terrorist attacks. So it's not like there was no precedent for people getting hurt or killed in, 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 the, in the Holy Land and yet, that ever said it's the safest place. So I think those words still stand today. I think those words still stand. What if someone's, you know, like some people say it's unprecedented because usually the soldiers were in danger. The Gulf War, the missiles hadn't hit yet in, um, 
in the Yom Kippur War, it was the soldiers that were in danger, and now there's been a massacre. But unfortunately, there's, there's been, there have been massacres before. I mean, there were massacres before 1948. There was a massacre in Hebron, was it, in 1927. So this is not unprecedented. Rivka, I, I think it was just thinking about this because you, you know, you had mentioned, Rivka, Rivka had mentioned that you, know, you have three kids in Israel and you let them decide what they wanted to do. I think that- the Well, I was, I was proud of, you know, my son said, I'm on a mission. Um, I was sent here on Shluchus and I know that I'm meant to be here to inspire the soldiers. Like he just felt it. And, and, and I had mothers who had said to me, aren't you gonna, and people said to me, aren't you gonna bring your kids home? And as a mother, I started to question myself. I, I really felt very strongly that if this is where he wants to be, I'm proud of him. And I went to the Ohel and I started right, I was gonna write to the Rebbe, am I making the right decision? I decided to call my son and ask him in that moment, what are you doing right now? He said, I'm putting to fill in on a soldier. And I just didn't even write the question. I just wrote my, I just wanna ask a bracha for my son. I wanna ask, him, I called my daughter, she said, I am on the way to a village to bring food to people. And she told me the name of the village. I have to look it up, but um, it was, it's 11 miles from Gaza. There are 20,000 Jews still there and they're in a lot of pain. And she went to give support to them. I, I, how could I ask if she should come well, home? I just asked for a bracha. I could have told you, I'm terrified I want to come home. Yeah, if she said that, right. If my daughter said to me, I'm terrified I, would, I want to come home, what would you tell your daughter? Rabbi Tao. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. asking me? Yes, I'm asking you if- If she said I'm terrified? Yeah. I would first try to calm her. But if somebody's really, really terrified, then, you know, I, I, I personally think that if you can get somebody to focus on where they can be productive, the fear will subside. When we feel like we have nothing to do, then we just stew in the fear and it starts to compound upon itself. Um, you know, I, I can be terrified right here in New York. I can be terrified. You know, there were people all out of Shabbos Friday who were texting me. I, I had a hundred texts from people. Should we go to shul this Shabbos? And, uh, you know, you can be afraid from here, but I tried to tell people stay focused on being productive focus on what you can do. You're going to sit at home, for sure you're going to be terrified. You're going to go and you're going to do something, even if it's just going to shul to make a statement, is, is doing something, then, then, it, then it actually helps the fear to subside. It's so true. I think the question really is, that can we take something that the Rebbe said that, re that relates to a specific situation? I guess the Igris, many people do this, and apply it in other situations is now and say, well, Rebbe once said, stay in Israel, it's the safest place. I think my child should come home, but I'm not going to bring my child home because of that letter that Rebbe wrote. The, the way that Rebbe responded during the Gulf War didn't sound situational. The Rebbe said, that Eretz Yisrael is described in the Torah as the land upon which Hashem puts his eyes, where Hashem is watching. There's divine providence everywhere, and how much more so divine providence is operating in the Holy Land. And the Rebbe said that as a as a existential truth, not as a situational uh, response. Right. Yeah, and I think so maybe maybe a person like Rifa, you mentioned that your kid found a mission. So you yes. know, what does that serve? Can you help people there? You have well, I, I, I want to actually just tell you this. I mean, I, I think that my daughter will be okay with this, but she, my daughter in Paris, Hana, she, um, and son in law, they, they have their baby and they were feeling they, they had that. My daughter had that feeling of fear and they found some tickets to Greece. As she took off the plane off to Greece, she got messages from friends who she, who asked for, she asked, they asked her for help and she straight away regretted leaving. And as soon as they landed, they said, we, we have something, we have a purpose, we're going back. So they actually made a choice to fly back because they saw that they had something to contribute. And that, that's precisely the point. That's what I was saying before about how we can be joyful right now. 
it's not a luxury to be joyful. It's a moral imperative. And I said, it's like a soldier marching into battle. He's not allowed to have low morale. You have to have high morale. You have to go in with a, with a winning attitude. So there's two things here. And they, they positively affect each other. One is, in order to do what you do, you have to be joyful. Because when you're joyful, you execute everything on a, on a, on a, on a, on a higher level. And let's level. just clarify, when you say joyful, you mean positive? Positive mindset that, re, that, that leads to a feeling of, of calm, a feeling of okayness. And, and so, there's, like I said, there's two things. There's, you have to be in that state of joy in order to do what you're doing or to do it well. And then there's the other thing, by doing what you need to be doing, that itself causes joy. So it then becomes a virtuous circle where by staying productive, you feel more joyful. Now, if you're doing nothing or you're, or more insidious, you're doing stuff that's a waste of time, like engaging with trolls, then you feel exhausted, then you feel more fear. So either wasting your time by sitting and doing nothing or wasting your time by feeding negativity, you're going to be stewing in your fear. But so can you pause for a moment? Um, I saw someone write a question earlier. She, she, someone who wrote that she feels lost. What should she do? What, what can someone do in the United States of America to feel productive? First of all, every single Jew has the ability to increase in Torah study and in prayer and in good deeds. That's across the board. And then you have to look into your, your specific situation, your specific opportunities and your skill set, and you have to put forth effort there. I would start with your inner circle. Instead of dreaming up interactions with people you've never met, why don't you reach out to everybody that you already do know and take it from there and see what happens. Hashem presents opportunities when we look out for them. That's right. Um, which either you said you think now's the time to, uh, how do you give chizok to an atheist Israeli? Um, I'm religious, but much of my Israeli family is not. How do I take these ideas to give to those without faith in Hashem? It's a good this, question. This is a question from someone. Yeah. Someone who's not faith-based. This is a question so, from someone in our audience. So hi, Joyce. Find oh, Joyce Asbria. We just interviewed Joyce and Rachel Schnee. Talk about women with Batachon. Oh, that, that's where the question no, was that, from? No, that wasn't the question. No, I just see that she... She's on. She's on, and she said, find one person to learn with. That's what, that was her advice. Oh, hey, find one person to learn with. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Um, oh, now I see it. Yeah. Yeah. But what would, would you say to this woman who was asking about someone who's an atheist or doesn't have faith? First of all, we all have faith. And you have to have faith in a Jew's faith. And sometimes you have to be like, you know, when I, sometimes as a parent, your kid will get mad and they'll say terrible things to you and you have to know they don't mean it sometimes people will say terrible things about Hashem they don't mean it don't engage don't debate them and make them learn how to be more articulate in something they don't even mean you have to learn how to gracefully just allow people to express where they're at and the best way to convey faith is by setting an example. If you use too many words, you come off as preachy, unless somebody asks for it. You know, sometimes someone you think is totally secular will surprise you and they'll say, tell me, you know, what's the Jewish perspective? And if they're genuinely asking for it, then sure, tell them. But usually the best thing is model it. Show them what it looks like to have presence of mind and focus and a sense of purpose, even while you're in pain. Let me just address one question here, and then we're going to wrap up because I know we're well, it's getting a little late. Well, we can By still go way, on. We can still. Know, still yeah. No, I just before you do, I just want to. I just want to ask him on this topic of atheists. I had once um, a, an atheist say to me. He said he's an atheist. You said he really has faith, but he said to me, 
if a, if the Holocaust happened and there's a God, I can't I can't be a part of a God that made the Holocaust happen. I can't have faith in somebody who allowed the Holocaust to happen. We're living in a Holocaust right now. I actually just listened to him. I didn't say anything. But I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I was wondering what you would say to someone like that, who says that to you. There's no right answer. It's always answer the question or not the question. And somebody who's expressing pain doesn't want to be, they don't want you to rationalize away their pain. I think they want empathy. And I would have a very easy time finding empathy for that for that pain because it's the same pain that i have so i wouldn't try to give a smart answer someone's asked but what would what would your answer be if you if you were just talking to yourself when i'm talking to yeah, myself if, if that you ask yourself that question what would you answer that i don't understand hashem that well, like I was saying before about the angels when they were horrified by the brut brutally uh, tortured and murdered sages and Hashem told them essentially, if you could look at all of reality in a glance, you'd be able to see how everything fits together. But if you can't, if you're a finite mind, then it's not possible. And I accept the fact that there are things that there's no way to rationalize them. And I particularly, since you're asking me a personal question, I particularly get disturbed by people who attempt to give religious rationalizations. Um, I don't think that's a faithful response. I think a faithful response is there are some things that we can't understand and we shouldn't even attempt to understand. That's, you're asking me, personally what do i do when i have that question is there any other questions that we yeah. wanted to a question came up earlier uh, it would be a good I mean, we can an hour when we wrap up but um someone's asking there's they're stuck and they want to know they don't know the direction to go in contributing they're sort of stuck and frozen um frozen yeah frozen mode, totally stuck, wanting to do more, but frozen, not knowing which direction to go and contribute. What would you say to that? If you're frozen right now, um, I would just, you know, you're on Instagram, you're on an app. So I would just go look at your, you know, the people following you, meaning people you're already in touch with, at least virtually, and send them a positive message. Nothing preachy, nothing telling them what to do, just saying, I'm sending you positive energy right now and see where it, do that do that with five people right now and see what happens i think something miraculous will will unfold and let me know by the way don't be greedy when you have your miracle let me know about the follow-up so i can enjoy too and i will add, add that you didn't hear me You're not as frozen as you think if you're part of the conversation so thank you for the question and, and wish that is a very good point that this frozen person just contributed to this conversation. That's right. So this was, so thank you for the question. By the way, I didn't say that we, I, I just want to clarify something that I wasn't saying that we're living in a Holocaust right now. I was saying it's the worst massacre since the Holocaust. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Rabbi Taub, when I listened to Shara Batach and to your classes, you had some really beautiful stories and um, and uh, mashallah examples um, that we could that really were heartfelt and I, I take with me on a daily basis. I wanted to know if you could share one of them that would help our listeners help us today in these times. If there's something that comes to mind, a great Betochen story. Yes. Oh my goodness! Now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, I, my favorite talking story right now is about a young mother with a baby who left Eretz Yisrael because she was afraid and then she got a couple of texts, hey, we need you. And she turned around on the next flight and went home. I think that that's my big talking story. That really blew me away. I, I didn't really get a, give a, get a chance to show you how much that affected me, but that that's an incredible story. 
Lots of nachos, by the way. <laughs> have lots of nachos from all your kids, but that's uh, yeah, it's about that's action. Very powerful. It's about action. But, yeah. Because you know, we're not talking about somebody who never felt fear. They felt fear. They even acted on the fear, and then as soon as they connected to their usefulness, maybe the fear was still there, but they became they pushed past. Scared. She pushed past. Feel, pushed, right. feel the Through. fear and do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's inspiring me right now. That's what we all needed to do. Feel, feel the. And by the way, I'll take a little credit. That's one of my former students. You're talking about. This happened. This is a story about one of your former students. Yeah, your daughter. Which story? Rosa. Didn't you just tell us? Oh, you're saying the story <laughs> that just happened now is inspiring to you? Yeah. Rivka, because your daughter was his student in seminary. Oh, I did. Right. I didn't realize what you were saying. Sorry, because. Yeah. So you're saying that the experience that just happened now that she left and then she came back. Do you know how I agree with you? And she's your former student, exactly. And you're her favorite <laughs> teacher. But this, this was so inspiring to me too. She had the fear, she left. Then she has a choice to go back or not go back. A choice to go back or not go back. And she may, instead of, instead of running away, she actually made a choice to go back into the war zone. That's right. Yeah, I found she that. Did what she needed. And Rivka, yeah, she, she, she I told left. her, Hashem gave you an opportunity to make the choice yourself. And had she yes. would not have realized how much she needed to be there. Yeah. Go back. Yes. You need to leave to come back. Like uh, Simon Jacobson told us, uh, some people have to lose God to find God. Oh, you know? wow. So it's, it's all about... And I... And I told her, now you're not going as a victim. You're going empowered that this mm -hmm. is what you want to do. Right. Right. Very yeah. powerful. Well, she'll feel very um, touched that you find that inspiring. I mean, we all found it extremely inspiring. I told her. Can I tell you the thing that was inspiring me before this? What was that? Because this is my new favorite story. But my favorite story story as of Erev Shabbos I'll share with you. Okay. I got a, uh, a voice note on WhatsApp from a, a mother who had taken my parenting course in the past. And she said she's in Be'er Sheva, which is in the south. And they're hearing sirens every, you know, very often. And they have to go and hide in the bomb shelter. And she said, you know, I'm so stressed out and I'm like, I'm losing it. And tell me, tell me what, tell me what to do. I said, listen, everything you learned in the parenting course, you're now being given the expert mode test to apply it all. It's the same lessons, but now you're under real stress. So she, you know, she sat with that. And the next day she got back to me and she said, you know what? A hundred percent. You, you, the way she connected, she said, Hashem chose me for this. He chose me for the expert level test. And she, she, she's at a hundred percent. And now she said, that's what I'm doing. I'm just focusing on giving my children as much safety and stability and calm and security in the middle of this craziness. And then th this is what she told me. She, th she said, so then she said, she started to, to connect to that, that serenity. And she says, she, she, she said to her husband, you know, I'm going to bed now. And I know very possibly in the middle of the night, I'm going to wake up to sirens and we're going to have to go in the shelter. She said, but you know what? I'm also going to bed right now. I'm thinking to myself, maybe I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll hear a siren. And then I'll listen more closely and I'll say, hold on. That's not a siren. That's a shaifer. Why is there a shaifer? It's not Rosh Hashanah. It's the shaifer of Mashiach. She says, I'm going to bed now with the expectation I may be woken up to find out the Mashiach is here. This is a mother in Beersheba right now. Wow. Everything that she's dealing with. By the way, I want to second plug your parenting course because um, I know a lot of people who said that it was life changing. So maybe that's another thing. You know, a parent who really wants to get some tools to be able to be more calm parent with more time. That's a good direction to go in. And I would actually call it a parent. It's the parenting course 
of Bittachon. Like that's what the parenting course is all about. It's my fa- I've done many parenting courses, but this parenting course was my favorite because it allowed me to feel like I'm a part, well, that I, to know that I am a partner with Hashem. So it made me feel empower- empowered. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's the whole secret. I mean, that's the parenting course in a word. You're 100% right. But I, and I, just to go back to what you're saying about this, this expecting um, the shofar to blow instead of the siren. So about these expectations of, we, you know, we, we, we are getting, we're in a place right now because it's so painful that we are yearning for Mashiach. And sometimes we can even expect it. Like, I expect it to come this Shabbos. My, my daughter called me from Israel. I feel Mashiach. And then Mashiach didn't come on Shabbos. So what are you supposed to do with the disappointment that Mashiach didn't come? You're opening up a whole new conversation here. Do we have time? <laughs> well, we, we can talk about it for a little bit. <laughs> yes, everyone's still on. Okay. <laughs> you have, do you have time? Do you have time? Okay. So here's the deal. We don't believe in Mashiach's coming because of cataclysmic events in the world. We believe in Mashiach's coming because it is our most basic fundamental belief that the entire world was created only for that purpose. In other words, if God made the world, as sure as he made the world, Mashiach must come and there must be a perfect world. So I think what happens is sometimes we get inspired that, well, things are so crazy, Mashiach's got to come now. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I th- think when you get inspired that way because of cataclysmic events, you need to sort of settle down and get back to the fundamental belief that Mashiach is coming not because the world is so crazy that he's got to come, Mashiach is coming because there's no other possible alternate reality. That is ultimately how the story ends. There's no other way that the story ends. So I think it's important that when you get excited about Mashiach because of circumstances, um, you don't just leave it there. Because then what happens is when it doesn't happen exactly in the time that your finite brain tells you it should happen, you get disappointed. But if you can come back to a basic belief that Mashiach has to come because that is an existential fact, then you're able to do two things at once. On one hand, you can have a very poignant sense of of eager anticipation. Let it be now, now, now. And at the same time, if it doesn't happen now, it doesn't disrupt your worldview. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, yeah. So in other words, you are having the faith that that it's going to come, but you're not disrupted by the fact that it's not here just yet. Or the fact that it didn't happen now doesn't mean that it's less likely to happen. The fact that it didn't happen now actually means it's more likely to happen because <laughs> it's got to happen at some point is um so she's flashing these questions i can't see what they are i'm just so blown away by what's happening in this conversation and some of the comments and some of the people who are taking part of this to learn yes we just and, um, saw two people i think it's joyce Joyce Azria and someone else took on to learn together. There's quite a few things happening here and the energy here is really positive and it's really special. Thank you so much for taking on these amazing things and let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing yeah. it. How to, how you know, I was we thinking hold... the other day. Well, well, actually, I just want, I, just want, I don't yeah. want to lose this. How do we hold on to the idea that Mashiach is coming now, not in the distance when it's been so many years of Mashiach coming now? Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying, though, that when you feel excited, acutely excited, like happens sometimes when somebody has a nice nifty gematria for the for the year, and oh, now Mashiach's got to come. It's nice that people are excited about Mashiach, but that's not really the right way to be excited about Mashiach. Like I said, Mashiach's got to come because there's no 
other possible way. There's no alternate universe in which Mashiach doesn't come. The world was only created for this purpose. So when your expectation of Mashiach is based on external factors, <coughs> then yeah, I think there is sometimes that experience of a letdown. Well, such and such happened, which meant the Mashiach has to come, but then Mashiach didn't come. So that, But if you base your expectation of Mashiach on the reality that this is the purpose of the world, we just, just today, in shul, well, she every show in the said world. not necessarily because it's exciting, because the Rebbe has been telling us since we were born. Mashiach's not coming because the Lubavitcher Rebbe said Mashiach is coming. The Lubavitcher Rebbe said Mashiach is coming because Mashiach is coming. I think for the Lubavitchers, by the way, that's a hard one to swallow. But think about what that's I what said. Faith is about Bitachim. You mean it's not because the Rebbe said Mashiach is coming. He was he was teaching us how to bring Mashiach. It's coming because because it says in the Torah. I'm so telling us reality and te teaching us how to see reality the way a Jew needs to see reality. She's. I think she's trying to say it's been so long. I know. It has. But like I said, every moment that Mashiach doesn't come doesn't mean that it's less likely to happen. Every moment Mashiach doesn't come means it's now even more likely to happen. We've ruled out all the minutes that Mashiach didn't come. We have less and less minutes left for Mashiach to come. It's more likely to happen now. Wow, that's a great way to look at it. So much time has passed. There's little time to go. And by the way, I'll add a little bit of a side point. I hope I don't distract anybody. But as the sun is coming up over the horizon, we are starting to get a little bit of that daylight, even though it's not really dawn yet, but we're starting to get some daylight. And we do see things that are very, very, very hopeful developments. And you can choose to focus on things that are horrifying because until Mashiach actually comes, yeah, we're still in Gullis and horrifying things still happen. And you could focus on that. Or you could choose to focus on the things that are absolutely miraculous. And my case in point, just to give you an example, I'm holding a piece of plastic in my hand right now. And this didn't exist I mean, I didn't have one of these. I'm trying to think of how long ago, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago I had. But, you know, the, look at the, look at how united we are. Look at how connected we are. Look at how we're able to spread positivity. You could say, oh, yeah, we could spread toxicity also. Yes, you could. You're right. But, and I said, you could focus on the negative. But look at the power that we have today. It's it, there. There are glimpses already of something really wonderful happening. We did an episode of a couple of probably last year called "Trust the Time of Your Life." We we interviewed uh, two women who were you know, past middle age, and we talked about how at any point in your life you can find your purpose, and it's never too late. And we find that very often when people reach middle age and a little older, they start to begin throwing in the towel, like giving up, like, okay, if I didn't find my purpose until now, then at this point, you know, why is it still worth the effort to keep trying? I'm already, you know, I've passed my prime, and we, and that's why we brought these two people into the conversation. They both, you know, went to at Rivka's end, uh, back to school in her feet and, and went to law school after she lost her husband. And you know her world was falling apart. She That's, she found. I just her. want to give, give a shout out to her. She's on. It's my aunt Janie New in Melbourne, Australia. And the other one and the other woman was Rifki Kaplan, who became a yoetzet in her forties, and she's in Svat in Israel right now. So, those were the two women. Right. So I think to the point of Mashiach, it's like you know, we, every moment we could act as though any moment now is happening, or any and, and that's how we should live our lives. Any moment now. We can find everything that is the reason we're even here. 
So I think that's just very generally, uh, I would say, helpful way to, to, to not an easy way to live, live um, life. But sure. Shri, Eva, do you want to see, read, the, read the next question? She said that her family's in Israel. I, I don't know how to scroll back. Oh, here it is. I feel survivor's guilt. My whole family's in Israel. I'm in America. What do I do with that feeling of guilt about my own fortune in life? You have to believe that Hashem put every one of us exactly where we are most useful. There's no accident. Your relatives who are in Eretz Yisrael right now are there because that is where they will be most helpful. You are where you are because that is where you will be most helpful. If you get through your guilt and start doing the things that you can do. But if you choose to wallow in the guilt, which is a great tactic of the evil inclination to get you in your head, then you may be sitting exactly where you need to be, but not doing what you need to be doing, and the opportunity gets wasted. So forget about the guilt and look around, open your eyes, and see opportunities you have right where you are. I promise you there are tons of opportunities where you are that you're needed for. I hope that's helpful to you. I found that helpful because, yeah, you could, you could feel guilty about survivor's guilt, you know, be sitting here where, where when everyone's struggling in Eretz Israel and especially the captives and the soldiers going out to war and you want to you wanna be with them, just, you know, and sometimes guilt gets in the way. So that's just a good thought a really empowering thought that Hashem puts us where we're meant to be. Like, this, this is the space that we are meant to be in. And what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with the place that we are in right now? Well, a lot's been done right here in the last hour and a half. An yes, hour, we'll have, have someone else say, that's such a good message, very helpful for a lot of us. Um, so I'm going to ask everyone a favor. I'm very happy that people are inspired in the moment but I'm not satisfied. I would like to hear reports. In other words, after this live finishes, if you go and you do something, if you take action and you see your positive energy start to come back to you in ways that were unexpected, do me a favor. You can follow me or you don't even have to follow me. You can send me a private message without following me, but just send me a DM. Let me know what happened. I would also like to hear about it. So you I would love send, to hear about it. You send Rabbi Taub a, a, a message. You could send Ida and I individually or to our um, podcast from the inside out. We would, we would love to hear your feedback and we will share it. Or I would say, if you give me permission to share it, I'd love to share it. Yes. But if you want to just share it with me confidentially, that's, yeah. that'll be my assumption. The mothers out there taking care of your children is building the future. Focus there is beautiful. That's a message from Joyce Ethria about taking care of children. That's a great message. Great message. Okay, someone's at, is there a group chat on WhatsApp that we can all join to? I know Rabbi Taub, you have a, a, a WhatsApp um, where, where you stream out different videos. How does I someone have, have my broadcast, broadcast? Yeah, if people want to get my content. Join? How does someone join that? How do they join that? I don't remember the number. Um, All right. While you're thinking about the number, I meant to ask you this question right in the beginning. Can you tell us, the, because it's, it's actually in the first class that you gave on Shabbat Tachan, the difference between faith and trust, the difference between Emunah and Shabbat yeah, yeah, the famous parable of the tree. Yes, I just think it's an important thing to share. It's from the Ramban, from Nachmanides, who was one of our greats. So he says that faith and trust are like a tree and fruits. There are many trees that don't have fruits, right? Not all, not all trees have fruits, but all fruits come from trees. So what does that mean? There is a faith that does not lead to trust in Hashem. But all trust in Hashem comes from faith. And he distinguishes. Faith can be a more abstract notion. I believe that God exists. I believe that he created the world. I believe he gave the Torah. But when it comes to how I feel, 
I can't really lean on that. I don't feel serenity from that. So that's faith without trust. That's like the tree without the fruits. But if I can attach to it emotionally, and I can, more than emotionally, viscerally in my gut, and I can feel my body relax. I can feel my breath relax. That trust is a product of the faith. So it's, it's really about taking something that's abstract, an abstract belief, and putting it into your heart, and even more than that, putting it into your body, where you actually live with it and, and feel it, where it changes your breath, it changes, it changes everything about you. It's, 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 it's physical, it's physical. Faith can be completely cerebral and, and, and remain completely in, in the realm of the mind. Trust is something that you actually feel, you feel more calm. You, you, you breathe differently when you're tapped into trust. So that's our goal. Our goal is not just to have faith. Oh, I believe in God. Okay, that's good. But do you feel like somebody who believes in God? Do you breathe like someone who believes in God? That's the trust. But just breathing takes practice. No, so 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 trust comes from faith, and it's putting the faith into action. Well, putting it into action is is another step, which is making behavioral choices based on the trust. Based based on the trust, right? So when, when you can feel it in your bones and you tap into that calmness, then you can make better choices and you can, you can choose behaviors that are more useful and more productive. By the way, sometimes what you can do, you don't have to wait until you're totally calm before you make better choices. What you can do is you can tap into a little bit of calmness and in that little moment of calmness, you make a good productive choice and then it'll initiate a virtuous circle where by doing something productive, you tap more, more into the calmness and then the calmness makes you to be more productive and then, then you're really good. Right, right. Like, right. so it's, a, exactly it's, you feel. it's got a ripple effect. It, it, it's a feedback loop in a positive way. Yeah. The analogy of the tree and the fruit is, is, is a good one. It's like some people have tr is trouble with faith and trust and both really. And, and so they're say, they say, well, I don't, I don't believe. So how would I do anything? How would I even act? But, but if you start to do the things that with faith and trust do, perhaps you'd get closer to that feeling of faith and trust. It's like, you know, what comes first? Chicken or egg. Right. Yeah. Right. Is it a bit, like you know let's say someone can say i'm spiritual but they're not necessarily keeping anything it's just like this theoretical thing i believe in hashem but they don't necessarily keep the torah but if you're actually keeping halacha then that would be compared to the trust yeah actually in shadab talking he says that pretty explicitly it's it's actually it's a very interesting discussion about why mitzvah observance is important for betaching and it's not what you would expect um, because a lot of times people will, will distort that concept and say, well, if you don't do what Hashem told you to do, how dare you expect him to treat you well? That's, that's not what it's saying. It's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, if you don't do what Hashem told you to do, you don't even trust that he has a good program for living. So clearly, you're not really, trusting him and therefore you're going to have the results of a lack of trust which we all know the results of a lack of trust is fear and anxiety and wasted energy so it's not like it's a punishment for not doing mitzvahs it's more like it's a natural coral corollary to not doing mitzvahs and that's why i would encourage people that when you're in fear try to connect more to mitzvahs because the act of a mitzvah is itself 
the greatest testimony to your trust in Hashem. The fact, the fact that you're following Hashem's instructions right now is an act of trust. And it will only bring you more serenity and peace. That's great. Great message. Did we miss some questions? I'm sure we did, but um, what can we do? Well, we could bring, we bring it all together now, and maybe for those of us, you know, we've had people come and go uh, for maybe those who just joined. Well, we, we had us. over, well, now there's 91, and it's already five to but the whole time we had over 100 people, and there were new people coming all the time, so there's been hundreds of people on here tonight, which is which is very inspiring, because that, that shows everyone wants to, to tap into being empowered by their faith and, and the betachon. Rabbi Tab, do you have like um, some parting words or some, you know, something empowering for us to, to leave with tonight? Um, we live in very remarkable times and it is easy to focus on things that make us forget that. But we live in very remarkable times. And, and it's easy today to do good and to spread goodness. And the only thing holding us back is internal distractions. So we need to be very focused on sharing the light and connecting with others in love and in positivity and just just do it you're gonna see you'll see it not only you'll see it you'll feel it you'll feel it you'll feel it in your body that's it just stay focused on positivity and goodness i feel like i need to hear this conversation every night and every morning <laughs> well at least it's recorded you can press play we, again we probably by the way i was thinking you know after a week a week ago tonight after shabbos um, or I guess, no, it was Sunday night, Sunday night after Simchas Torah. So I got a hundred texts. Rabbi, you have to say something. You have to say something. And I'll just tell you personally, I'm not a guy who likes to say something. You're going to say, oh, well, why, why are you on social media? Why do you have, why do you put out videos every day? Okay. Trust me. I delete 20 videos for every video I post. <laughs> I'm not a guy who, who's rushing to say things. So I didn't say anything that night. I, it took me a day to process it, and then I said what I could say. And then I started seeing the responses. And I didn't think I said anything particularly profound. But people were extremely grateful. And I realized that as much as I feel like I have nothing to say right now, I probably have a duty to be saying twice as much as I normally say. Yeah, I, I, and really, I, I concur that one, yes. Really, I should be on 18 hours a day. I should break to, 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 to daven, to eat, to sleep. And, and I should just be live streaming 18 hours a day. I'm not really, I mean, I don't know. Now I'm going to make excuses why I'm not, but I don't Are know. Are we your it's... first live stream since this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got to do start... more of these. Sorry? This is our live stream period. This is our, this is our first, first live stream yeah. period. Yeah. But yeah, we haven't really done it before. But, uh, well, yes, the... yes, I agree. I, I have told quite a few people and for whoever's on here now that your Shara Bittachan podcast is one of the best things to listen to right now. It's 20 minutes a day. You could just press play and it's just, it does, it does what you've shared to do. It does, you know, you just feel like your heart is open and you can breathe and you can let go of anxiety. That's what your Shara Betachan does. It just really helps you tap into a place of, you know what? I want to bring some light into the world. Yeah. That's yeah. Soul Words. Soul Words the Soul Words. Soul Words.org, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Highly, highly recommend. Rita, was there any quest, any other, because you were off for a little bit, so if you wanted to ask anything that you had in mind, that because you you you, were, you weren't able to be here for a little bit. 
Was there well, anything I, think, I, I think you did a good job picking up, uh, holding the fort while I was out, and then I came back. But I think we addressed most of the questions. And if we did address your question, um, we apologize. Uh, and maybe we'll do something in the future. And I think we, you know, I think we accomplished that to accomplish tonight, which is how, you know, knowing how to in, in increase in our, in our trust and faith and Hashem, be more positive and take action to do our part, whatever it is that we do in this, in, in this situation that we're, we're dealing with. Can, can I ask you a very, very daring question? I mean, I don't know if this is okay to ask, but you know, let, you know the song Tanya Ama Rabbi Shmuel ben, um, that uh, when there was the decree for the ten, for the ten Sadikim, um, who was it that went up to the Shemaim? Yishmael yeah, right. oh, went yeah. up to Shemaim, and Hashem said it was a decree, and so this was decreed from above, and so then some people will say this might be a decree because we're being punished for something that we have done and we can look at ourselves and ask ourselves what can we do to, to work on ourselves or to change like we have sinned in some way and this this is a punishment for that is that a legitimate well, comment there, there's some legitimacy but then it takes a very sharp turn into presumptuous territory um there it's a, it's is it a, it, okay? Let me take apart this statement because there are parts of this statement. To believe that everything that happened is God's will, and I say happened past tense, to believe everything that has happened is God's will, as painful as that is to accept, that is the Jewish belief. That's true. However, it is a second and separate assumption to assume that that is necessarily a punishment. Who says, do you know that? Do you know for certain it's a punishment? Yeah. And I would say to those who are eager to assume that it's a punishment, <clears throat> do you think that calling it a punishment is the only way to motivate Jews to do teshuva? Is that, that your opinion of Jews? That by threatening them, that they will be tortured? That is the only way to get them to do teshuva? I agree, we need to do teshuva. You know how I know we need to do teshuva? Because we always need to do teshuva. And if this situation causes us to take ourselves more seriously and our relationship with Hashem more seriously, then I think that's the proper response. And I see it happening already. So yes, let's do teshuva. But who says it's because, well, you were bad, you didn't do teshuva, you were punished, you better do teshuva now or you're going to get punished more. Where, where does that come from? Who, who's making such an assumption? Yes, let's all do teshuva. Uh, you know, <clears throat> in, I think it was 1976, there was a, a massacre of school children. In Malot, there was uh, there was a group of kids from Tzfat, and they were hiking in the Golan. And a couple of terrorists dis disguised as soldiers snuck into the school where they were sleeping, and murdered them. There was a, there was a hostage situation. It was it was. I mean, you're talking about terrorists deliberately targeting school children, holding school children hostage, and then murdering them in cold blood. And I think, I think it was 17 children who, who were murdered. And afterwards, the Rebbe said that he'd been pushing for months already. This, this massacre happened in the late spring, early summer. I think it was in May. And the Rebbe had started speaking about Mivza Mezuzah about the mezuzah campaign back in the winter during Hanukkah. And so the Rebbe said, you know, for months I've been speaking about mezuzahs. And I had this feeling that it's very important that we get kosher mezuzahs everywhere. And then they got the report that the shliach in Tzfat, Rabbi Kaplan, all of Shalom, went and he checked the school. And the school where the kids came from 
had exactly the amount of invalid mezuzahs as the amount of children who are murdered. So the next wow. Shabbos, yeah. So the, the next Shabbos that Abba said, I want to clarify something. I am not saying, God forbid, that these children were murdered because they didn't have kosher mezuzahs. God forbid. Is the punishment for having an invalid mezuzah death? God forbid. That's preposterous. Rather, that Abba said, it's like a helmet. It's like a helmet. That, that when you put on a helmet, if you get shot, it protects you that you don't get killed from the, from, from the bullet. But if you don't wear a helmet, is not wearing a helmet causing the shooter to shoot? The shooter is shooting. Putting on the helmet doesn't, doesn't make him not shoot. And taking the helmet off doesn't make him that he does shoot. But by wearing the helmet, when the shot comes, you're protected. So the Rebbe said that by having the kosher mezuzah, you protect yourself. It's not that not having the kosher mezuzah, God forbid, causes bad things to happen. God forbid. But that when we need protection from the things that are happening in the world, so the mezuzah and other mitzvahs that we do give us added protection. So I want everyone to understand. Yes, we need to do to show, and we need to do more mitzvahs. But we don't, don't have to scare Jews and tell them you were bad and you were punished and you better get good so you stop being punished. We can tell them in a very positive way that we have a wonderful way to protect ourselves. It's by connecting to Hashem and doing His will. That's it. Okay, and um, thank you for that. That's much more inspiring <laughs> than the question. <laughs> um, thank you. And, you know, on our podcast, we always end with a quote. And we, you have some good quotes. Can, <laughs> do you have a quote for us? <laughs> uh, well, do I have a yes. quote for you? Yes. You, well, you know, I think what's the one? Um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. That's one of my favorite ones like, of yours. Cool. Yeah, but you want to know something? I, I stole it from Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, so you can still give us a stolen one if you want. <laughs> um, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I made that up. That was mine. We know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say, by the way? They say, all wisdom is plagiarism. Only, stupi only stupidity is original. <laughs> All, all the truths have been said before. Right. All the truths have been said before. Because if they're true, they were always true. We, we know the truth. The truth is that we have to do what we were put here to do. Fear and guilt and all that stuff is, and, 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 and anger, it's all distractions. Let's just be positive and be productive. That's it. That's the quote? No, that's not a quote. Oh. <laughs> Somebody can memify it. Maybe one of the young people out there can take that. And Eva, make you, it. you have some good quotes. Well, not mine, but um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. It's not about our faith in God, but God's faith in us. But I don't remember the first part of it. But everybody, Tal, do you, can you fill in the blanks? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of ways that I could go. I don't know. Is it Abraham Lincoln? They, they, he said during the Civil War, don't ask if God is on our side, but if we are on his. Is that the quote? Something like that, I think. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, but that's, that's uh, a good one because God is on our side. It's right. about us being open to that. To receiving it. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Or be the truth you want to see. That's a very oft quoted one, but I love it. It's so simple, but it's perfect. Just do the, be the truth. That, yeah. Yeah. That's Gandhi. Yeah. Well, my, my favorite one is there's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. I think that's. Uh, that's Leonard Cohen. Next. Leonard Cohen, right. right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a Tikkun Olam quote. It's, let's, let's fix. If you see, I saw a picture 
recently somebody posted a picture of Leonard Cohen flying to uh, Israel, I think during the Yom Kippur War. Wow. He flew to Israel during the Yom Kippur War, I think. There's a quote from the Lavach Rebbe, but I'm probably going to get it wrong, but about how to see what's wrong with the world. Well, if you, if you see what needs to be done, you do your part to fix it, and you've seen the part of it you can make a difference in. But if you see what's broken in the world, do yourself that needs a reckoning or to repair. Need to rep yeah, there we go. I, I butchered that one, but. No, but that's great. That's it. You didn't butcher it. I Okay, well, I didn't like it. It's not a good word, but I, I yeah, let's see, see what needs to be repaired and do your part to repair it and then do your tikkun olam. It, it, it's, it's, I mean, not, nothing is uh, by coincidence, but in this week's parsha, parsha Spiracious, Hashem says, let there be light. Like there was darkness first and then it's the light and then Hashem brought the light. So we have, we have darkness right now we can each do our part and replicate creation and bring the light as we're part like you said in the parenting course we're partners with Hashem. yeah yep all right well thank you rabbi tell thank you everyone for joining and we hope this was insightful and helpful learned a little something here tonight thank you very much we will be share we will be saving this will be recorded so if you want some therapy every day, you can listen to it and also go to Rabbi Taub's Shara classes. I started listening to them again. I went through the whole thing last year. And there's also a book, Gate of Trust, Shara Bittachon, which is very, very good. But if you're more of a podcast person that likes to listen, I mean, Rabbi Taub also adds in a lot of stories that are relatable. So both are good. The book, Shara Bittachon, Gate of Trust, and also um, the classes on soulwords.org on Shara Bittar. All right, everyone, have a great night. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye.